Good morning. I'm uh, honored to be with you, and I thank uh, the, the foundation and the wonderful organizers of this event. This has been uh, superbly put together, and I, I go to a lot of conferences. This is one of the best organized I've been to in a long time. Uh, we've been hearing a lot in the last day and a half about something crucial for the future of our information uh, and journalism. That's, the, that, that's how we can help improve the supply. And we certainly need to do that. Uh, my purpose this morning is to talk uh, a bit about supply, but much more about demand. And uh, I'll explain what I mean. This is our agenda. And I always like to remember where we have come from in order to think about where we are and where we may be going. So I will offer the, uh, the most brief history of media that you will ever hear. I think of media starting uh, perhaps with the drawings on cave walls, people leaving something for other people to see that told a story. And maybe another pivotal event was the invention of uh, what became paper, the papyrus, in, dec in, in millennia ago. And then everyone recognizes the invention of the book and the movable type and the printing press as the uh, singular media breakthrough, perhaps, in history and until recently. The telegraph was another important move forward because prior to this invention, the fastest that information could go was as fast as a horse could run or a train could go down the tracks. Now, speed of media was the speed of light, of information. And uh, profound changes from that leading into the broadcast era when radio was at the speed of light one too many. Uh, a tremendous, tremendous change caused by it. Television, another uh, very pivotal event. I think of the moon landing as the, uh, in a sense, the peak of broadcast television when for the first time, several billion people around the world uh, were part of an event together, which had never occurred before. If you've studied communication theory, you've probably seen that uh, thing at the top, which is by Claude Shannon, who invented, in, invented information theory. And it is a pretty good, uh, in fact, it's a great description of how media worked, how information moved in the era of uh, manufacturing and distribution, which is what we did in the 20th century. We would make things, if it was print, we would print it, make a package, put it into trucks, and send it out. If it was a broadcast, we'd make it, put it out on the air, or later, cable and satellite. And then this happened the most important change in media since the printing press, where the flow of information is a lot different, and we're having to deal with that. And it's also crucially not about manufacture and distribute. It's about manufacture, put it somewhere online, and people come and get it. It's a very different model, and people in my business in journalism that I spent a long time in uh, are still grappling with that. The things that make me excited about media in general are the idea that the consumer has become a creator and that because these tools that we use are collaborative tools by nature, the creators become collaborators. And we're seeing that in all kinds of ways, including such things like fact-checking networks around the world working together. And where we're going gets very interesting, partly because of the uh, adding of sensor measurement devices in the environment, things that measure uh, all sorts of stuff. In this case, it's in Northeast Honshu Island in Japan in the vicinity of Fukushima, 
where citizens, not, not the government, not the power company, are going around measuring radiation levels and it's all being put into uh, a map that is updated constantly. This is a new kind of media where it combines human intelligence, machine intelligence, and sensory data. And we're going to see more and more of these kinds of things. And it's uh, very interesting to me where it's going to go. We have an endless supply of information. It's just endless. And the, the, the lines, as I wrote about in a book more than a decade ago, between journalism and not journalism are blurring. But I want to just point a couple of cases where we can be clear. This is journalism. The, the poet, Washington Post does not always get things right. But they do journalism. They have processes. I think we can agree equally this is not journalism. It's a, a random blog and not very interesting, but it's not journalism. Again, the BBC, the best, I believe, English language broadcast news in the world, clearly journalism, even though they don't always get things right. But brilliant journalism. And Nat and Foxy disco dancing is not journalism. I celebrate, I celebrate the act of media creation that this represents, but it's simply not journalism. That's my only point. Things get more blurry, and you've seen this again and again around the world when people who are not journalists are creating journalism, sometimes because they walk by a scene that is highly newsworthy, as was the case in Tehran a few years ago, when this young woman was murdered in the streets by a government sniper. And someone walking by with a video camera, part of his telephone, captured these horrific, heartbreaking images. It was journalistic. It was not by a journalist. I'm no longer interested in who we call journalists. I'm interested in what we call journalism. And I hope we make that distinction. Similarly, the tsunami that hit Japan in 2011 that led to the meltdowns at Fukushima was the most videoed and photographed event probably in history to date. Again, people who are not journalists doing acts of journalism. It's so easy to start media companies now and media products. This was a blog by one person uh, in 2000, the year 2000, has now become a media company covering politics in the United States and is something that everyone in politics feels generally that they should read. Uh, someone with a lot of talent and drive can do this now. It was hard in the past. Filling in gaps that have emerged, drastic gaps in local news coverage, we're seeing some things like a Berkeley, California blog that does what the uh, Oakland newspaper and the San Francisco newspapers simply don't do anymore. Local news. It's not enough. We need much more of this, but it's something we should take note of. People in countries around the world doing journalism that challenges authoritarian regimes. And something that I'd like to point out is journalism, I believe, and that is by NGOs and advocates who explain their point of view, who do relentlessly fine reporting, gathering of information, and then put out reports. I believe Human Rights Watch does the best journalism on human rights abuses around the world. They have a bias. They state it very clearly. Their bias is that they're against violations of human rights. But they're doing something that's quite journalistic, and I welcome them into this ecosystem because I believe in and, not or. I believe in journalists and bloggers and things online, not or. And this ecosystem is getting fascinating. In so many ways, this is a very poor representation. But it's some of what we're seeing. And I think we should be welcoming this new, diverse, and I think more in the end, 
sustainable ecosystem than the one we had in the past. Which brings me to demand. I, so I'm, I'm, we have a lot of supply. We don't have enough in some places. We have too much in others. But I'm worried about demand, very worried. And I'm worried about it because people have been passive consumers of media in the past. And we have so much data and information now, and so much of it is garbage. And we have to find ways to sort it out. We have to think about what's accurate, what's trustworthy. And when images like this, which appeared after the attacks in America in 2001, race around the internet, even though they're fake, it's a real problem because it's hard for the truth sometimes to catch up to the lies. We have to work on that. And it's not just people with Photoshop. It's sometimes our best news organizations that publish wrong information, in this case, bad information that helped start a war. I have to point out that none of this is new. At least misinformation is not new. There's been a lot of it around for a long, long time. As long as there has been information, there has been misinformation. So the thing that is new is this coming together of technology, bad actors, and new ways of distributing the knowledge and, and get, having people find it that we're not sure how to deal with. And the, the bad actors, the bad people who are doing this are, in my opinion, far ahead of the good people trying to stop it. And we need to work very hard on this. Fact checking is one way, and I uh, certainly applaud it. I hope that there will be more of it. I'm puzzled, by the way, that we need to fact check uh, journalism. I thought journalists do the fact checking, but this is where we are. And the consequences of misinformation are quite, quite damaging. We have to work very hard on it. And I also need to point out that it's going to get worse in some key ways. It is now possible to create videos that for all purposes show someone saying something that he or she did not say. This is from the University of Washington, an experiment they did that is, I think, quite alarming. Uh, we're going to have to work on new ways to discern truth from falsehood. And that brings me to the work I'm doing and have been doing for the last eight or nine years uh, that follows on the work I was doing with citizen journalism and worrying much more now about demand than about supply. Because I think demand and the places where it intersects with supply are one key way that we can fight the problem. And news literacy is one of the expressions people use for this, uh, this kind of work. Uh, it's not my favorite expression. It's one that, that many use. But I define it as helping people develop critical thinking to determine what is trustworthy and useful in the media we consume, create, and share, and the intent to do this with integrity. That's my definition. Others have different definitions, but I think that that gets at what I'm working on. And it starts and really goes all the way through with principles among which is to use the media, don't consume it, and participate with integrity. So I have a bunch of principles that I teach in my courses and bring to folks in different places. And the first one, the absolute most important, is that we need not, in this world, we have to be skeptical of everything, absolutely everything. I'm skeptical of the New York Times. I'm skeptical of a random post on Facebook. But I'm not equally skeptical of the New York Times and a random post on Facebook. 
I'm using judgment, and we all need to use judgment, and I work with my students on that, and they're getting quite good at it. There are lots of ways to use judgment. One is to look to see if something is likely to be true or false. The first thing people say when you're finding out if something is real or not is, is where did it come from? Who wrote it? What's the basis of it? That's the first question. It's not the only one. I have in my mind a credibility scale that you're looking at. And I think some things start uh, way over there to the right in the positive credibility, just by definition because of their record, of the trust I have developed in what they do. And something like a random comment, anonymous comment, starts way over there on the left. What I, I want to point out is that this scale does not start at zero. That random comment is in negative credibility. I think that random commenters would have to work very hard just to have no credibility at all. That some things remove credibility from the ecosystem. And we should think of it this way and, and adapt our, our work to it. Another principle is we have to ask questions. And we can do that if it's something close to home as the email that you're seeing from my city government to me when I asked a question shows. The closer we are to it, the more we can ask questions. The, the more important it is, the more we should read widely and ask questions. We need to go outside of our personal zones of comfort. I read many things and listen to many things that I know I am going to hate because it will make me so angry, politically or otherwise. I do that on purpose because I will learn something from things that, that are contrary to what I basically believe. We have to go uh, into our own biases, understand them, and be clear about what they are so that if we are wrong about something and someone points out that we're wrong, that we won't be defensive and refuse to admit it. There's a, something called confirmation bias. And what it means is uh, basically that if you believe something very deeply and someone shows you evidence that you're wrong, you will end up believing it even more. This is human. It's a human reaction and we have to work on countering it in ourselves and help others do the same. And then the final principle for the people who were consumers <coughs> is to understand how media work, how media are created, and do some creating, and understand how media are used to inform, how media are used to uh, push people in some directions, to persuade, and how media are used to manipulate us. All of these things are part of how it works. Because I believe we're not literate unless we are creating media. I have principles for creators. And the first four of those, thorough, thoroughness, accuracy, fairness, independence, I think are journalistic. I don't think any journalist would, would disagree with those. But there's one that's important that we need to add in journalism and in our social media use for the 21st century and that's transparency. We need to explain to people what our biases are, why we are saying what we're saying, and in many cases, how we're doing it. And I'll give you a couple of very small examples. This, journalists are starting to do more of this. Uh, and David Farenthold, a reporter at the Washington Post, last, a year ago, in the political campaign, was asking, he was looking into uh, Donald Trump's statements that he had been giving a lot of money to charities. And David could find no evidence that this was true. And he asked his readers, his followers on Twitter, to help him do some reporting. And they followed up with, tr with wonderful uh, assistance that was documenting what he was discovering, which was that Trump was not following through on his promises. And in fact, that 
he was misusing money that had been given to his own foundation. This was an act of great transparency, an, un, an uncommon act of transparency by a journalist, and it, among other things in his reporting, led to David winning the Pulitzer Prize this year. So this is something I'd like to see more of for journalists. Another example of transparency can be seen on Wikipedia, which is behind every article. You will find basically every change that's ever been made to the article. This is transparency of another kind. I don't know why we don't do that as journalists when we change stories. Why don't we show people what we've changed? Sometimes we change things that are online because we've made a mistake and we don't want people to remember that. But that's not a good idea. We should explain why we make these changes and show them. Not in every case, perhaps, but in, I think, most. Sharing of information in this social age is, it's the place where supply really be becomes intertwined with demand. And we have new rules we have to apply to ourselves, I think, and to people we work with. And transparency becomes very important that and care, being careful about what we share becomes very important. And this is, a, this is my transparency when I mistakenly shared something that was not right, it was not true. It was a, uh, I shared something from a, uh, a parody website and it was false, but I shared it because it was believable and I wanted to believe it. So I explained to my followers what I had done, uh, how much I regretted it, and what I had learned. And what I, what I learned above all is we have to be skeptical of what we see in the online world, especially when we want to believe it. And especially beyond that, when it supports a negative view we may have of someone or something. That's, when the, that's the time to be most skeptical. And I try to practice this. And I probably will get fooled again in a very embarrassing way, but I'm going to try hard. Brian Stelter is the, media, the chief media reporter at CNN, a superb journalist. And in his Sunday uh, program called Reliable Sources, he has a section of, of commentary. And he's made it part of his mission to bring news literacy concepts to his audience. And this is one of my favorites he did last, a year ago. And I think this is a wonderful admonition, a wonderful bit of advice, which is to triple check before sharing something. I'm not expecting everyone will, but it's a good idea. So who should be working to promote these ideas, uh, which I think are very important, and I think in the last year we've discovered that we do have a lot of work to upgrade ourselves, not just the journalism. I think it's all of us who need to be at it. Educators certainly should be involved. Uh, there are not a lot of people teaching media literacy and news literacy. I'm sorry to say that. It's not been a big field. I think it should be much bigger. Uh, I do my part, but I can only get to certain, a certain number of people every year in my teaching. We did a massive open online course, uh, uh, what called a MOOC, which was freely available. And the, the course materials are online. Anyone can use them to uh, offer something like this themselves. But that only reaches a few thousand people. We need this to reach hundreds of millions of people and billions in the long run. So who else can do it? I think journalists have a duty to make this part of their missions. And journalists have not made this part of their missions in the last 50 years, and I think, it's, that's, a, that, I think that's a mistake. I think journalists would be more trusted had they made this a big part of their missions 
And it's never too late to start, uh, and I'll talk a minute about a project I'm involved in. But when we talk about getting scale, getting this to the uh, masses and masses of people, well, who has scale? It's the technology companies, the platforms that Emily talked so eloquently about yesterday. And they recognize that they have a problem. They're thinking about what to do. And uh, I don't think that they want to be the people who decide what is true. I think because they don't want to do that, they should be helping the rest of us do that for ourselves. And I'd like them to do more. But there's been some small starts in progress in that way. Something that I'm working on, this was just announced, announced last month. We're just putting it together. Uh, I'm shifting a lot of my duties to this, is what we're calling the Arizona State uh, News Collab, uh, a collaborative laboratory that's aimed to help the public do these things that I've been talking about, to find ways of better ways with experiments of understanding, engaging with news and information and helping people they are with do the same. And we're going to work with lots of people. Our uh, goal, and these are our initial funders, there are several unannounced that we'll be announcing soon. The, our goal is to do collaborations and experiments with people who are already doing good work and do some of our own things that we think are useful. But we will work with news organizations, with schools, libraries, and other civic organizations, and with tech companies to the extent that they will permit it. We have a lot of ideas, and we have uh, an initial project that we're starting uh, We've already started the talking, and we're going to launch it on the ground early in the new year, working with four news organizations in four different cities in the United States. None of them are on the coast, uh, so they're not in the, uh, the, the very liberal areas. They're, all, they're, they're in a variety of areas that are both liberal and conservative. Uh, three are with the McClatchy Company, which is a newspaper company that's now a web and news and everything else company. And we have uh, a lot of optimism. We're going to work with them to help the community elevate its news awareness and using news literacy techniques, but we're going to focus with them specifically on being more transparent and engaging and what I mean by that here is having true conversations of equals with people in the community to be helping each other understand and elevate the news ecosystem. I also strongly believe that this news literacy concept should not be something that we just add to other things, but that we should take it by topic area. and then embed it, put it, make it part of these topics. And we're, we, we've just received a grant to do another project that will, be, that will involve health and science. And there, this is a key area for one main reason. The consequence of believing misinformation in something like medicine, the consequence can be threatening to your health or your life. We think this is a very ripe area for exploration. People are working on it in many ways, but we're going to come at it from the news literacy perspective and see how we can help. Over time, we hope this lab will work with lots of people in lots of countries. We're talking with uh, people in many places. Uh, it's very early days, but I hope that we'll have some work going on here at some point and in other parts of the world. My message on news literacy is really this, that to reach as many people as we possibly can and, and to reduce the damage that misinformation is causing, we have to collaborate. And we have to do it across disciplines, across ideologies. 
borders, ages, everything. And I want to conclude by saying, mentioning something. I have not used the expression fake news in this talk. That is deliberate. If I were in charge of all journalism everywhere, I would ban that expression. And here is why. Because it has been taken over, taken over by people who lie all the time, who use the expression to talk about things they either disagree with or don't like. So my advice, I, I'm going to have a lot of trouble with this because it's now part of our vernacular. And the Associated Press says it's fine to use that expression. I disagree with them. But I'm going to just invite you to think about using the correct language like misinformation, disinformation. Uh, mistakes, uh, fraud, whatever the correct word is, rather than that expression that I refuse to use. And with that, I'm very glad to be here and uh, would love to hear your questions. Thank you. Slide的事情，最近发生的事情，最近发生的事情，最近发生的事情，最近发生的事情，最近发生的事情，最近发生的事情，最近发生的事情，最近发生的事情，最近发生的事情，最近发生的事情，最近发生的事情，最近发生的
in journalism. I love journalism. It's, it's part of my heart and soul. But I confess that I'm not optimistic that journalists will take that advice. Uh, and I, I regret that. I think that's part of why people are losing faith in journalism, and I think that's, that's just a terrible problem. However, I think this also is something for people who are the audience for journalism. For, and I'm, I'm much more, I'm an audience more than I'm a creator. I think a lot of this is up to us and to, that we need to slow down, we need to take a breath. And when I said in that slide that we should be skeptical, I mean we should be really skeptical. There's a, uh, there's a concept in the food world called slow food, which is, uh, came from Italy and basically it's uh, use local ingredients, do things slowly and enjoy the process, do it, but not, don't do fast food. I believe we need to adopt some slow news <laughs> concepts. And for the person seeing something, especially as it flies by on social media, uh, the skepticism is more and more important. And I have a scientist, a friend who's a scientist, who says that whatever he sees in the media of any kind, about any popular journalism article about, uh, or broadcast about science or medicine, he automatically, he said, puts it in the category of interesting if true. I think that is a great place to put all breaking news that we see, no matter who it comes from that we have to wait, we have to take our time, we have to take a breath. Again, this is somewhat against human nature. Our brains, the way our brains work is that we keep hitting the refresh button. Uh, and I think it takes practice. But I, I've become uh, very much skeptical of everything I see in breaking news situations. I just don't trust anything until I've seen real evidence. Mm -hmm.